Tony Wong is one of Hong Kong's most important comic book creators. And by one of, I mean he basically built the entire industry, controlled the majority of it with an ironclad death grip through the 70s and 80s, and is viewed as a national treasure. And to add insult to injury, he's got seemingly ageless skin. But what if there's another secret lurking behind Tony Wong's four-color legacy? I'm Dave Baker. Today on Total Nerd, we're going to explain who Tony Wong is and why he's so important to the history of Hong Kong comics, and just what he had to do in order to make it to the top. But before we get started, please be sure to subscribe to the Total Nerd channel. Leave a comment. Let us know what other Total Nerd topics you'd like us to explain next. Born Wong Jan Lung in Hong Kong in 1950, Wong Yuk Long, aka Tony Wong for all his English work, was a child obsessed with manga and manhwa. Manhwa is the term for Chinese comics. The more you know, baby! He made his debut in the pages of Epoch Comic Weekly at the ripe old age of 13. Yeah, 13. All throughout his teens, he was published in publications such as the Chinese Student Weekly Reunion and Youth Park. At age 17, he started his first publishing company, Jade Man, because he wanted more control over the creation and publication of his work. In 1969, at the ripe old age of 19, Wong found his breakout comic with a book called Little Rascals. Don't call me Norman. Call me Chubsy Ubsy. No, no, no. No relation to the beloved American slapstick comedy program starring children who would all grow up to be drug and sex addicts as a means by which to cope with the fact that their childhoods were robbed for our collective enjoyment. It's fine. Don't think about it too much. It's not like we would ever do that again after the torment the original cast went through. What's the high sign? Go on in. Yeah. Life's cool. Very, very cool. No. We're talking about Tony Wong's Little Rascals. Tony Wong's Little Rascals is a series that follows two brothers, Tiger Wong and Dragon Wong, two long-lost half-siblings who reunite over taking up the reins of their father's martial arts dojo. Tiger Wong, the dark-haired brother with the iconic Eugene Levy eyebrows, if Eugene Levy was the type of guy to sport an Affliction t-shirt and scream, don't fuck with me while me and my friends are in this dive bar just trying to have a good time, because we will fight you and take off our shirts. We will fight you right now, Brosif. You know, he's the series protagonist. And basically, Tony Wong's Mickey Mouse. Dragon Wong, the older half-brother, he's got more of a, I won't fight you in this bar right now unless you try and fight my brother, and then the odds are distinctly in favor of me going to jail for probably shanking you with an off-brand beer bottle. The two brothers also have a mutual best friend, Golden Dragon, who's a bit more of a comic relief character. Think living embodiment of slapstick tribal tattoo vibe. In its initial conception, Little Rascals is basically an Osamu Tezuka influenced punch fest. I mean, obviously a comic about two brothers owning a martial arts dojo is going to take, you know, kung fu direction, but it's worth noting that the artwork for Wong's books is produced in collaboration with a veritable army of assistants, which is how you get work going from this a more what if Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy was obsessed with knives, rending human flesh, to this. A more classically representational 1980s style that screams, I love not sleeping and rendering folds in MC Hammer pants. To finally, this, which is the purest depiction of, did you know it's 1999 and comics can be colored in Photoshop? That has ever existed. Over the course of the multi-decade run that Wong has had with these characters, they've evolved quite a lot. However, they've always stayed fairly close to their martial arts roots. Yeah, Little Rascals actually has rebooted, eventually retiting itself, Oriental Heroes. Tony Wong's work all centers around a single subject, violence. And no, not choreography or dance or the, you know, hyperkinetic ballet of fists and feet. Like just full-on murder. Yeah. He has a real thing for knives. Every one of these Little Rascals comics is just stab, 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 stab. It's like, what if Vern Troyer became a professional bodybuilder and then took self-defense classes from the Zodiac Killer? The general aesthetic of most of Wong's work from this time can be described as, what if Little Hercules took first prize in the World Lightweight Prison Shanking Competition? In 1975, Bruce Lee and the Shaw Brothers had turned martial arts cinema into a conveyor belt of piping hot punches don't actually make that sound effect. 
This served as a catalyst for the manhwa market to ride the wave of kung fu comics. And guess who was dead center in the hurricane of success? Our boy, Tony Wong. The backlash of this violence manifests in a pandemic of people being worried that this was going to have an adverse effect on the youngins. The government of Hong Kong introduced a law called the Indecent Publication Law, which restricted and censored the types of comics that could be published. This caused massive damages and chaos throughout the industry. But Tony, he had a plan, he had a loophole. You see, the law only applied to comic books, not comics in newspapers. So what did he do? Started a newspaper based on the sweet, sweet dollar bills he was raking in. Tony Wong took Jade Man public in 1980. They were riding high and they were the kings of the manhwa world. At one point, if you believe these numbers, Jade Man was supposedly touching between 85 and 90% of Hong Kong's manhwa industry. They were, for all intents and purposes, the only game in town. <coughs> Monopoly. <coughs> Monopoly. <coughs> Monopoly. <coughs> Criminal enterprise. <coughs> Monopoly. Wong was ostensibly a 1920s robber baron, but you know, make it comics. Which I guess means either four color themed suits or bende dot stogies? And then the Hong Kong stock market crashed and the manhwa industry went from a $700 million a year industry to a $100 million a year industry. Surprisingly, Jade Man Comics somehow managed to hold on and not go bankrupt. So Tony narrowly avoids being put out of business and now he's back on his feet. So what does he do? Does he rest on his laurels? Our guy T-Bone? Hell nah! He's out here in this world. He's on this world domination shit. He's trying to conquer. He's out here. He basically, uh, he just took it global. He started coming to America. Came to America. Manwa in America. In 1988, Tony Wong started an American wing of his company. Jade Man Comics launched with four titles. The Blood Sword, the aptly named Jade Man, Force of Buddha's Palm, and, of course, Oriental Heroes. These four books were released in extra-large 64-page format, and if you listen to Tony Wong, it's because they want the readers to get the most bang for their buck. In actuality, well, it's probably because these books have been serialized for years back in Hong Kong, and they just wanted to burn through loads of their backlisted stories, you know, because it's cheaper that way. This era of Jade Man comics isn't half as wacky as the stuff in decades prior. Well, at least not half as hyper-violent. But they do include 400% more butt stuff. Hey. Not to be shitty, my dude, but your is misspelled. Maybe tone down the homophobia and hire another assistant editor to go over the books in pre-press, you know, just once before they go to print. Just a thought. I don't know. Might be crazy. The printing of these bad boys was really weird. The covers had this kind of rubbery quality. If you let them out in the sun together for too long, they just melted. They were also all in color, but not the traditional way that comics are usually colored here in America. The colors are mostly done using a single traditional plate tone, but for moments of key emphasis, they do a fully painted panel. It takes a bit to get used to it, but once you know what's happening, they really help build a dramatic tension and act as a nice period at the end of the sentence. Most of these comics were localized for Americans by Mike Barron of Nexus fame, or Len Wein, you know, the guy who co-created Wolverine. However, the best part of these Jade Man comics is the weirdo propaganda that they publish in the back of every book. These issues feature posed, you totally would have thought this was stock footage if it, you know, wasn't for Tony Wong literally being the fuck in them. They detail how comics are created by Tony and where he comes up with the ideas. And then his team of collaborators and artists work on his layouts to create the finished book. I wonder if that rings false to anyone else. Huh? You smell that? Smell that? Is that, does that smell like burning? Or maybe just shady businessmen acting like a choke point for other people's hard work? Huh? Yeah. That photo of Tony Wong looks kinda like Someone? I don't know. I'm coming up with a blank. Like the fact that Tony Wong is splattering his name all over every one of these comics, regardless of style, genre, competency, or, you know, just general execution. I wonder if that read is a little bit bogus. Also, side note, one of the artists that worked for Tony who actually got credit for his work is Ma Wing Shing. He's awesome. He's basically like Hong Kong's Jim Lee. He eventually broke away from Jade Man and started his own publisher. Jonesky, where he did his own long-running comic, Storm Riders. He's a beast. Look at those speed lines, baby! F Margaritaville! I'm trying to live in Speedline City! Unfortunately, 
Most people of the 1980s didn't really seem to share my level of enthusiasm for Jade Man comics. They failed to take off in the US and 1993 saw the company stop publishing. Before Jade Man ran aground, Tony Wong made close to two billion Hong Kong dollars. Not the company, he as a person. And here's where things get even weirder. In 1991, Tony Wong goes to prison for forgery. Yeah, the businessman magnate who at one time controlled 90% of the manhwa industry in Hong Kong was sent to prison for four years for forgery. What are the intricate details of this criminal enterprise? I couldn't tell you because most of the English language resources about him are just kind of like, he went to prison for four years. They're just marks. They believe his kayfabe. Everyone touts his achievements, you know, turning a blind eye to his obviously shady ass business practices. It just is what it is. Tony Wong got out in 1993. It's weird how they only want you to serve two years of a four year sentence when you're a f***ing billionaire. So what did he do first? He made a book about his time in prison called Tiger in the Cage. Did he go around and try and get someone to publish it, you know, to help him rehab his image? No. He just reestablished himself and started a new company called Jade Dynasty. He just started publishing comics again, and before anyone knew what was happening, guess who was running the world again? Tony even relaunched Little Rascals again, this time under the title Dragon Tiger Gate. Here's Tony celebrating issue 900 of Dragon Tiger Gate in a fly as hell camo duster. Nothing says I'm a criminal mastermind behind Kong Kong's biggest comics empire like a sports coat you can pick up at Bass Pro Shop. Tony Wong's legacy would be more than 10 times the amount of fame of a traditional comic book creator, but he's a mogul. He's in it to win it, man. He's a mover and a shaker. So what is he up to these days? Other than making weird braggadocious claims that barely pass the sniff test, he's putting together a theme park of all of his comic book characters. That's right, back in 2015, the man, the myth, and the legend, Tony Wong threw his hat in the ring for the F it, let's just nakedly copy Walt Disney Award. He announced that he was gonna start an $800 million theme park. It would have three areas, one dedicated to comic book characters produced in China and Hong Kong, one to famous movies, and one for comics and film-themed amusement rides. When asked for specifics about the park, he just repeatedly says, I can't give you any specifics because then people would copy me. Which, you know, sounds completely like a kid saying, my dog ate my homework. Currently, I can't find any information about this park and whether or not it's actually been made, but we're still talking about it, so I guess he won. So, you know, maybe it exists, but also maybe the same person also totally drew all these Little Rascals comics over the years. And maybe Tony Wong isn't just a naked liar, craven businessman who, you know, likes the image of being a self-made artist, but is actually a shitty businessman. I don't know. I don't have the answers to any of these questions, but the kayfabe surrounding it sure is fascinating. And the work is awesome, regardless of who made it. Who doesn't like little chibi kids like stabbing each other to death? So does anything else matter? And that, it's in the eye of the beholder. Regardless of which side of the aisle you fall on with Tony Wong, you've got to admit, being a 70-year-old man in a subtly floral-esque camel pattern button-up and converse with totally not dyed hair is a pretty sweet look. But you know, maybe I'm just biased. So, what do you think? Is it time we had a longer conversation around the act of creation and authorship here in the States? Is it worth looking into how comic book creators always get screwed by weirdo businessmen types with mob connections? Should I just move to Hong Kong and act as Tony Wong's body double in the elaborate Paul's Dead performance art piece that we're definitely planning together? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, please like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.